So they've got cover overhead to keep, you know, right. keep them protected from the hawks. And they, they uh, the baby quail are actually, they are actually bug eaters. The biggest part of their diet is, is, uh, well, that's a nice brim. <laughs> You folks wondering how I, how I can stand here on my dock and catch them because I feed them right here. <laughs> We're not trying to fool anybody, no. are we? <laughs> is made possible by the Eastern Band of Cherokee Indians. Great Smokies, Great Outdoors, 1-800-438-1601. By Brunton, get out there. If you've ever wondered what happens to a big time college football coach when they retire, then this story's for you. After 12 years as the head coach of Auburn University, Coach Pat Dye retired from coaching, but he's still a very busy man. Only now, instead of studying game tapes, he spends his time studying wildlife management on Crooked Oaks, his farm outside Auburn, Alabama. Before you moved out here, you started doing things on the property, right? Golly, look at that. Oh, yeah. Yeah, we planted, we planted all kind of, can you get him off? Yes, sir. Good <laughs> night. Look at that. See that, see that uh, stripe across his head right uh -huh, there? Uh-huh, uh-huh. That's the reason he's called a copper, copper nose or copperhead brim. On account of that? Yeah. Boy, he's a fat little thing. Look yeah. at that. But you you actually bought this place with the intention of, of doing a lot of improvement uh, to it, didn't you? It. Yeah. I've made so many mistakes, you know, trying to do, trying to develop property and uh, things that I, that I could have done different at the time that it would have saved a tremendous amount of money. And time. And time. And time is is just as you know just as important as money because uh, you do something wrong, you have to wait two or three years to see if you've done it right or not, and then once you see you've done it wrong, you have to take it out and start all over again. Right. Now the coach grew up on a farm, but he still met many difficulties in improving his land for wildlife. But he had help nearby with the wildlife biologist at Auburn University. The things he learned made him realize that others might need some help with their property as well and led him to create the consumer reports of land and wildlife management. The reason we started this Wildlife Trends uh, publication that we're doing is because I've, this is the third place that I've developed mm -hmm. as far as the hunting and the fishing and the, and, and the aesthetics. Right. And it's all important to me because I think the beauty of a place is just as important as, you know, having a place to hunt and fish. Your magazine is not just for somebody who owns a scad of property, No, is it? it's for people that want to manage for, for songbirds and hummingbirds and things in their backyard. I want you to take this fly rod and go out there and catch you on this fly rod because I'm catching more fish than that you That is so fun, Coach. In this publication, we'll talk about what it takes to, to put uh, birds in your backyard, and right. what kind of plants to plant, what kind of trees to plant for nesting, and what kind of feed to feed, and water in places. Mm -hmm. Coach, I was really impressed when I read that you don't sell any ads in your magazine. We wanted to be able to provide the absolute best and latest research and technology and information that we could put out there without any influence from any outside sources. Right. And you start you start selling advertising, then you become you, then you come under the influence of whose product that's advertising in your magazine. Yeah. Yeah. The thing about it is that when you do something, you want to do it right. That's exactly and right. You want to have the best information and the most current information, you know, available. And that's what this magazine does. You know, I'm one of the owners of the magazine, mm -hmm. but I have saved enough money but I should call one on the fly rod. Yes, sir. And uh, I've saved enough money myself taking the magazine and reading the articles to pay for... The subscription, you know, I'm to, sure. To, to pay for 10 years. I'm sure you have. <laughs> I won't live long enough to enjoy all of the things that I'm doing, but somebody will. Mm -hmm. And you, you like to think you're going to leave a place better than what it was when you when you got it. Well, 
I somehow managed to talk Coach Dye into giving me a tour of Crooked Oaks, and it started with the house itself, which sits on a hump in the middle of his pond. Well, when I found this hump out here in the middle, I had planned to build, there's an old home site right up here mm -hmm. on the hill. I had planned to build a up house there. there. But when I found this hump right out here in the middle of the lake, I said, well, why not? Oh, yeah. Let's put the, and I am really. So your pond really wraps around your house. All the way. That's I, right. I could have, I could have taken a track hole and in 15 minutes made an island out of it. Just lived out here right in the, on the island in the middle <laughs> of the lake. But this, uh, we actually had to take off about two feet off the top of that to flatten it out to, to put your, uh, to put the house on. Huh. When, when I started cleaning, cleaning the place up to put the pond and the mm -hmm. house and everything here, I, was, I got out in the middle of that, I mean, just a big mass jungle out there. I said, well, my goodness, it is old, been an old home site here. I've got sawtooth oaks planted all over this place. Mm -hmm. You know, several, several thousand. Mm -hmm. And what is it about the sawtooth oak? Well, it's a, it's a prolific aiken producer. Okay. And uh, aiken is the number one staple for turkey and deer and quail and mm -hmm. squirrels and everything in the, in the wild eats aiken. And in the areas where I planted these sawtooth oaks and, and uh, was able to manage the competition and, and fertilize around them and so forth. Right. You know, I've got big specimen oak trees that are 10, 12 years old. Mm -hmm. See these two trees? Mm -hmm. These two trees were planted at the same time as this tree right here. Okay. It doesn't look like it's that much difference no, now. No, it doesn't. But at some point in time, see, I've cleaned up around these trees, all of them, in the last four years. Mm -hmm. and, and this tree right here did not get near the attention and chance to grow as, as the bigger trees did. Coach, what do you have to do to a place to, to attract quail? What, it seems like that's the hardest well, it is, and, and, game uh, to manage really, for. It, it is. My place here is 600 acres, uh -huh. and I could have, if I, managed, if I managed strictly for quail, I could probably have, you know, 15 covers of birds on this place. Mm -hmm. And Coach, I was reading in your magazine that one reason why southern Georgia and parts of Alabama were the quail became so prolific there in the last century was because of some of their farming practices, crude farming practices. That's right. Uh, sorry farming was good for quail. <laughs> <laughs> but now we clean farmers with just as soon as the, the crops are in, they, they go in and break up the fields and, mm -hmm. and bush hog all of the the stubble down and, it, and they leave it like that, you know, through the winter months. And, and the way we used to farm, we, we harvested the crop in the fall and, and the corn and cotton and peas and grain all, you know, it stayed there until the you spring. You left it lay, yeah. It stayed right there until the spring. So that's what they need is that cover? They've got to have cover, they've got to have food. And they've got to have resting habitat or nesting in places for the mamas and daddies to right. raise the broods. This is just an opening I left when I planted these pines, because I custom planted the pines to leave openings for, you know, for food plots and game. Of course, I planted the, planted the sawtooth oaks around it, and I come in and plant an annual uh, food plot for quail every year. Uh -huh. Hey, I have to ask you the other quintessential question. How do you keep the squirrels out of your feed? Well, I'll just put enough out here for the squirrels, too. <laughs> That's one thing about living on the water, um, is, is that there's something going on here all the time. Mm -hmm. Now, I went to school at Auburn, and I've heard a lot about the coach over the years, but the part of his farm he took me next told me all that I really needed to know about him. Hey, baby. You want the pig here? Yeah, he's a nice dog. He's a pretty dog, Joe. He's a fine dog. Yes, he is. Okay, Joe. You got your pig here. How about Buck and Sue? Buck, you and Sue want a pig here? Okay. Yeah. Huh? Buck, you want a pig here? Okay, Buck. There's your pig here. Jack. Hey, Jack. I've been around dogs all my life, and, and I've been around foxhounds and rabbit dogs and house dogs and spaniels and labs. There's nothing in the world like a bird dog. I mean, I mean, 
and the relationship that you build with a with a bird dog because I mean it's a partnership, it's a team, and uh, they just they'll go out there and just hunt their heart out for you. As hard as we try, we can never make anything as beautiful as the Lord makes it. Mm -hmm. And and what I try to do is to take a place like this and and not take anything away from it. Just try to add a little touch yeah. here and there. And uh, but it wouldn't it wouldn't make any difference how hard I could try it. I could never make anything as beautiful as this creek running down through these no. rocks and rapids and the little waterfalls and the flowers that grow naturally. That's right. Just a natural beauty. That's right. But you know, this is what we see being destroyed all over the country too. Yeah. That is so tragic in in, in some areas where you know, it's, it's done carelessly or without right. without thinking about the, our future. And, and Coach, you know, people got to remember that a place like this is affected by what happens upstream from here. Absolutely. Miles and miles and miles upstream. It's kind of a lifetime hobby, and yeah, you're never bored. Yeah. When you can when you can get out and and do something and see results and mm -hmm. and it just. Uh, it's a fun thing for me from daylight to dark every day. And I'm constantly, you know, looking and watching things grow and looking where I can uh, enhance what I'm already doing. And yeah. It's, uh, it's just a lot of fun. I've heard a lot about you over the years. All good things. Oh, goodness. But I, but I have to say that you, one, one thing I've heard about you that's really true is that you are the real thing. <laughs> <laughs> you are. You're the real thing. Well, you know, I'm not smart enough to be anything else. 